بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق أجمعين سيدنا محمد عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أكبر الصلاة وتمام التسليم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وعملا صالحا متقبلا ورزقا حلالا طيبا أكرم الأكرمين وبعد uh, I would just like to begin with um, uh, thanking our guest speaker uh, Ustaz Fadl Suleyman جزاك الله خير for accepting the invitation uh, to be part of this program. I've been knowing Seth Father for a long time now. We've never met, I think, in person, but subhanAllah, we've been in close communication and, uh, and constant, actually, uh, discussions about multiple uh, topics, mashallah, specifically the topics of Quran, the topics of Quran. That was the, the topic that brought us together. And subhanAllah, there is now a kind of a close relationship, even though uh, we have not met yet, but subhanAllah, the, the Quran always brings people close, and specifically this beautiful topic of Qiraat. Uh, alhamdulillah was uh, one of the mutual interests um, and for sure not to mention the, the great work that Ustaz Fadl has put in uh, the translation of the Quran, the Bridges translation of Quran, uh, the translation of the 10 modes of recitation or the 10 Qiraat, uh, mashallah, this is the first of its kind, the first time the Quran was translated in multiple Qiraat uh, and, and uh, it was very important to make Qiraat accessible to the English readers uh, to to get a sense of the beauty of the of the of the multi-layered nature of the meanings of the Quran, that one word can be pronounced in two or three different ways, and it implies multiple uh, meanings and not contradicting meanings that as we are going to learn today, inshallah. But actually, it uh, just adds uh, uh, different dimensions for the the meanings. It completes the meanings together on multiple levels. Uh, Seth Fadl is the founder of. Uh, Bridges uh, Foundation. It's, mashallah, a famous organization that does a lot of work for da'wah. It, it has a very strong online presence. Um, I think it's uh, UK-based in in, uh, uh, in UK, and it's it, most of the activities, if I'm not mistaken, are online, specifically now. Uh, so, mashallah, the outreach of the organization has been very active and efficient. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless your work, um, inshallah. So today's topic is, um, is very important uh, and it's very exciting as well for me on a personal level, to be honest, and I believe for Seth Father as well and for, for a lot of the people with us today, with the audience, um, the topic of Qur'at has been inaccessible for the, the English-speaking audience, which is really a big problem, right? A lot of people just hear about it and then... Um, they didn't know really what does Qiraat mean. They didn't know much about the, the concept of Qiraat. Uh, this stigma or this misconception about Qur'an that we have multiple versions of the Qur'an and you have multiple copies of your Mus'haf, which means it's not very authentic as you, you, you Muslims uh, uh, claim all the time. It's also a very common misconception. And if somebody doesn't know what does Qiraat mean, this is a very strong shubha and a very strong misconception that people can follow. Um, so the, the mere interaction with the, meaning, with the meaning or the concept of Qur'at for English uh, speakers or English audience uh, is the mere knowing of the existence of something that is called different modes of recitation and probably some different uh, parts of the Qur'an that you can hear from, from like a famous Qari or Imam in, in Salah. Even I remember on a personal level to lead Salah in different Qur'an was, was a challenge, right? I remember uh, the, I did myself, uh, I myself did this multiple times in Taraweeh, for example, and it's, it's, it's an event for people, right? It's something that people would be really in awe and, and, um, and they would be astonished with, number one, the fact that there's such a thing, and number two, with the beauty, of course, of the recitation and the Qur'an. Uh, I always get positive feedback about this, but I remember up until very recent, people would sometimes, I don't want to say criticize, but they are scared. Sometimes people are just scared, like, why would we read in a different way? Why not just like the normal Quran that we know, even though, okay, you read with the right Hafs and probably some other recitations or some other modes of recitation were actually much more popular than Hafs at a certain point of time in, in a certain uh, country. What would make Hafs prevailing and not the other uh, 19 riwayats, right? This is also a question that people would ask after they dig into the topic. And now, you know what? Actually, Hafs, like, wasn't the first one historically, probably wasn't the best one in terms of, like, the... The profiles that those imams, they're all for sure credible and they're all uh, certified and they're all very popular imams and scholars. Not only in Qur'an, by the way, but other multiple disciplines, but it's still, uh, yes, Imam Shatibi said, he, 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 he added this beautiful comment about Hafs when he listed the names of the Qur'an and he said Hafs was famous with his, um, uh, 
uh, like um, high level of qira'ah and, and very authentic uh, way of pronouncing the letters and the words of the Quran. But still, we have a lot of other imams that were actually closer to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ than Hafs, than this riwayah that, that we, we read through. So um, again, the, just to, to, to make it uh, short, inshallah, and to begin the, the discussion with Ustad Fatal, I just wanted to, to highlight the importance of this topic and uh, the, the importance of addressing tafsir, tadabbur, specifically understanding the meanings of the Quran, pondering and reflecting on the meanings of the Quran through qiraat is a beautiful dimension that has been neglected uh, recently or for, for like for a long time. So it's very important to connect with the Quran from this side. Uh, and I'm sure and I guarantee that this will take your level of, of reflection and connect with the Quran to another level. So this is what we're trying to discuss today. Uh, it's a big topic, just I need to also make this uh, disclaimer. It's a big topic and it has multiple different perspectives. We'll try to cover some of them. Uh, and I would just like announce that we're starting tomorrow a, a class, a course on the Quran sciences and one uh, section of the course will be on the Qur'an. So this topic will be addressed again, probably in multiple other perspectives and dimensions as well, so to expand more on what we are going to discuss today, inshallah. The course starts tomorrow, uh, every Monday at 6 o'clock EST time or Windsor time, uh, inshallah, for six weeks. So not only on Qur'an, it's on Qur'anic science in general, but we'll for sure tackle the, the topic of Qur'an, uh, inshallah, bimillah. So um, without further ado, I would uh, like to ask uh, Ustaz Fadr, inshallah, to to begin, Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. All praise is, are due to Allah, the creator, the cherisher, and the sustainer of this universe. May his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet, Muhammad, and his descendants, and his companions, and his followers. Dear respected followers of Prophet Muhammad, who are watching us on Al Majlis, Jazakumullah Khairan for coming, and Sheikh Yusuf. Jazakallah khairan for the invite. And uh, if we want to talk about the Qur'an, I would start by saying that honestly, if I were a non-Muslim and I studied the different Islamic sciences, probably the Qur'an could be the main science that would attract me to embrace Islam. In the topic of the Qur'an, it is us, the Muslims who established this branch of knowledge, the branch of knowledge called the Qira'at or the modes of recitation of the Quran. And it is us Muslims who distinguish between the differences or variations uh, 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 and, and, and uh, brought them out for people to, to, to learn. First of all, we need to understand what are the differences between the Qira'at. Of course, people know that we have 10 main Qira'at, 10 main who are the students of the students of the Sahaba. So they are mainly from the uh, generation of Tabi'i Tabi'in, the followers of the followers of the uh, companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, they have 10 main Qira'at that are mutawatira, massively reached us through massive uh, 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 ways. First of all, the, the, the differences between the Qira'at are either dialectical variations, which do not affect the meaning in the least at all, or non-dialectical variations, which do affect the meaning. The dialectical variations are of two categories themselves. Merely pronunciation differences or performance. And I will give examples on that. An example on the pronunciation variation. The word believers in English is mu'minun in Arabic. But in some Qira'at it is mu'minun, not mu'minun. At the end, it just means believers. It means the same in Arabic and in English. Some tribes pronounce every Hamza. Ah, ah, it's called Hamza, this sound. Ah. And some others do not pronounce it when it comes as the first letter in the root of the word. So Arabic words, 
uh, come from roots, and the roots are usually three-letter root. Some words have four-letter roots, but there are not many. But some, most words have a three-letter root. So when you return the word mu'minun to its root, the root is a-ma-na. So the a, the hamza comes here as the first letter. We call it fa'il kalima. So it comes as the first letter. In this case, many tribes would say mu'minun, yu'minun, not yu'minun, which means they believe. Yu'min, not yu'min, okay? And, and there are other words which the hamza may not be the first letter of the root and still it is not pronounced like dhib, fox, is dhib. Bi'r, well, is beer. And we say beer in, 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 in most of the Arab world, actually in, in Egypt we say beer. Bi'sa, we say bisa, bis, bis. So here the hamza is not actually the first letter in the root one still it is not so these are merely dialectical due to the different accents of tribes and they do not affect the meaning at all not in the least it is also interesting to know that some letters can be pronounced in many ways though they are just written in the, in a single way so the letter alif a is is, is very clearly, it, it, people know how, how we write the alif. Just a stick like that, horizontal stick, um, a vertical stick, a vertical line. But it is pronounced in several ways. It can be a or a or a or a. All of these have one way to draw it, just a vertical line. So the word Musa, which means Moses. Musa can be Musa or Musa or Musa. Duha can be Duha or Duha or Duhe. At the end, it's just Musa, Moses. It is Duha, which, which means the early morning and so on. So these, this is one of the types of the dialectical variations and they do not affect the meaning at all. There is also the performance differences. And some imams uh, uh, have, most of the imams have different performance from, from each other. But, but some imams, for example, pause before the Hamza, like Imam Hamza, the Subhanallah's name is Hamza, and he pauses before the Hamza. But uh, 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 the word land, al-ard, land, al-ard, he pronounces it like that, al ar. So he pauses before the Hamza, al pause ar. It's just performance. He pauses. It's the same word, letter for letter, but he 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 he's he's doing it in a different way. So the word is the same as we said. Some imams extend the vowel if it comes before the Hamza for about five seconds, which we call six haraka, uh, or six movements, if you like, open your, your, uh, your fingers, six, six fingers. The, the time that it, take, it took you is nearly four or five seconds, that's, that's the, the, the interval in which they extend the, the vowel. And some only extend it for four, and some only two, and some extend the vowels after the hamza, which we call it maddil badal. And some do both. So the word, for example, yura'un, which means they show off, can be read in many ways, like yura'un, or yura'un, or yura'un. At the end, it is just a difference in performance and the words meaning stay the same, which is your own, they show off. And the second type of variation is what can affect the meaning. And this is the problematic one. For any person who is ignorant about the concept of the Qira'at of the Quran, Muslim or non-Muslim, and when I say ignorant, I don't mean to insult anyone. 
Ignorance is not lack of intelligence. Ignorance is lack of information. I can be the most ignorant among you all guys about a certain branch of knowledge. This is not a problem. But the problem is when people are ignorant and they do not want to admit that they are ignorant. So to understand this, we need to know that the Qiraat is by far the biggest linguistic miracle which no language other than Arabic could have embraced. Then uh, 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 the Qiraat could have not existed in other languages. As I'm going to explain to you now some examples that will prove to you that it is the biggest linguistic miracle and that no other language could have, could have embraced the Qiraat and that's why, subhanAllah, Allah have descended the Qur'an in this rich language, the Arabic language. The Qiraat, as I said, fascinated me. And the one who studies the Qiraat will see the Qur'an's words vivid and moving. They will become in high definition mode, HD. Just a very small variation in a mere diacritical mark. We have marks used as a phonetic guide above or under letters. We put them and it gives a different sound for the letter. And, and just changing a diacritical mark in the word can change the meaning. And it enriches the whole meaning of the passage. And I'm going to give you examples. If you are lost, don't worry. I'm going to give you examples. The whole meaning of a passage, as I said, is built through layers of qira'at, modes of recitation. If a word ends with a dhamma, or the sound u, it means that this word is the subject of the sentence. But if it ends with a fatha, which is the sound a, it means that this word is probably the object of the sentence. And let's go to an example. The Quran says in Surah Ash-Shu'ara, Ash-Shu'ara means the poets. And allow me to share a screen to show you this. Uh, do you allow me to share screen, uh, doctor? Sure, Sheikh. Go ahead, inshallah. <clears throat> okay. Yes, no, that's right. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, Allah says in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Ayah number 192 and 193 and 194. وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنْزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَنِينَ Concentrate on those three words that are in blue, because the variation will come here. نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَنِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْذِرِينَ مِنَ الْمُنْذِرِينَ It means, and most surely, it is a bestowal from on high from the Lord of all realms. The trustworthy spirit came down with it upon your heart that you may be of the forewarners. And this means that most surely, uh, the Qur'an is a bestowal from on high from the Lord of all realms. The trustworthy spirit is Archangel Gabriel. He is Angel Jibreel. Came down with it, with the Quran, upon your heart, O Muhammad, that you may become of the uh, forewarners, to become a prophet. Let's see the variations here. This is how we read it in Hafs narration. Nazala bihi ruhu al amin Bihi ruh there is another qira'ah where this zain, this letter zain, is mushaddad. Mushaddad means stressed upon. It is doubled. So it is nazala, not nazala. It is nazala. You see this shadda? It looks like a, an inverted comb. This means that this is nazala. Here, a ruh has a dhamma. So it is spelled ar-ruhu. Here in this qira'ah, it is a fatha, ar-ruha, ar-ruha. 
So here when we read this, we say, نَزَّلَ بِهِ الرُّوحَ And that's a big difference in meaning, by the way. نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ means the trustworthy spirit came down with it. But نَزَّلَ means that بِهِ الرُّوحَ الرُّوحَ here, it means that the trustworthy spirit became the object, not the subject. So we see now what it means. All narrators, except for Nafi' ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Hafs, and Abu Ja'far, read it as, he, with a capital H, which means Allah, he bestowed the trustworthy spirit with it from on high on your heart. So here the, the object became Archangel Gabriel himself. Let's see how this affects, how this meaning com com complements the meaning, uh, the first meaning, and both together give us the full meaning. Let me uh, end the share screen here. I need to end share screen. One moment. Let me check how we end the share screen. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, stop share. Okay. So, uh, this part of the surah, we need to understand. This part of the Shu'ara, the poets, deals with the allegation of the kuffar, of the um, uh, uh, disbelievers, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to receive the Quran from the devils, not from Allah. Some of them said that the devil revealed it to the Prophet, and some said that the devils are carrying it to him. So if you read ayah number 210 in the same surah, it says, وَمَا تَنَزَّلَتْ بِهِ الشَّيَاطِينَ And in no way have the devils been descending with it. So the qira'ah of Hafs and Nafi' and Ibn Kathir and Abu Amr, the qira'ah that we normally read, that is, نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ means what? Means the trustworthy spirit came down with it. It is informing us of who carried the Quran to Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> it is the trustworthy spirit. So the carrier of the Quran is Jibril, the angel, according to the first Qara'ah. The second Qara'ah, which gave us a different meaning, says, Nazzala bihi ruha al amin. Uh, it means that he, Allah, has bestowed from on high the angel, Shibreel, with the Qur'an. And, and, and uh, this, this very slight difference in diacritical marks gave the sentence a different meaning. Uh, in this sentence, Allah is the subject and Jibreel became the object. While in the other narration, Jibreel is the subject and the Quran is the object. So, therefore, the holistic meaning of this ayah, according to both qira'at, to both modes of recitation, is Allah is the one who sent the trustworthy spirit, Angel Jibreel, with the Quran upon the heart of Prophet Muhammad. So one layer says, it is Jibreel who carried it to you. The other layer says, it is Allah who sent Jibreel carrying it. Both together, they are different meanings, but they are not contradicting. Both together are two layers of understanding that will give you the holistic meaning, which is Allah is the one who sent Jibreel with it, the Quran, upon your heart, O Prophet Muhammad. This is the meaning of both Quran. So the nation of Hafs and Warsh gave us a layer of understanding, that Jibreel carried it, not the devils. And the narration of Al-Kisai and Ya'qub and Hamza and Khalaf give us an extra layer of understanding that it is sent from Allah himself, not 
ذا ديف اوكي زي ما خيرا استاذ اي ثينك اتس I think these two layers are, are serving the contextual understanding of the AI as well, right? You mentioned that it's, it's, it's responding to the, the claim that he brought the Quran from the devil, right? Yeah. So, the, so the AI, so this, the, this theme, the theme of this part of the surah wants to emphasize that it's coming from, it's not coming from the devil, right? Yes. So if, if we, as you said, if we put the two meanings together, the first one emphasizes that Jibril is the one who brought it and then to negate any other misconceptions that, okay, so probably that was, something that he invented with Jibreel? No, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brought it with, with Jibreel, right? I, I think this is the way um, it, will be, it will be summarized. So if I only know the narration of Hafs, that means mm -hmm. I'm missing out on part of the meaning, right? That means, or, or I don't want, I, I'm not sure the word missing out is the right expression, but it means that there is another layer of the meaning that I actually didn't know. So me as a person who wants to, like a Muslim person wants to, to, to reflect and to ponder and to connect with the Quran, is it very important for me to uh, connect with the meanings of the ayah through the different qira'at or just like I know hafs, I know one qira'at, I know warsh, whatever the qira'at is, and I just want to, to go for it. And is it that big of a deal? Like, is it like, if I know only one why that means there are a lot of things that I do not know Quran, or how can we understand the, this uh, multi-perspectives okay. multi approach to the ayat? Okay, well, the first thing that I learned from my sheikh when I went to learn with him the qira'at, I only know Hafs and I read the tafsir of Hafs narration. So am I okay like that with the Quran, understanding it fully? He said, you understand the Quran according to the Hafs narration alone. There are more layers of understanding of the ayat of the Quran, which have different qiraat. So not all the ayat of the Quran have different qiraat. Maybe in every page there is only one ayah or two ayahs. Some pages don't even have any variations. But there's like, there's, there's, there are, uh, uh, I think, about 400 differences between all the qiraat that can affect the meaning. In these 400 ayat, there are more layers of understanding to understand. Uh, which, uh, 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 yes, we need to learn the Qira'at and the Tafsir and the Tadabbur all together. So if we learn, Tadabbur means pondering or reflecting upon the Qur'an. If we learn the Qira'at and the Tafsir and the Tadabbur, we can fathom these ayat fully. But your question is, is it important to do that? Yes, it is important. Which books of Tafsir, Sheikh Yusuf, are considered the best, bo best books of Tafsir? They are the ones that take the Qira'at into consideration. Like At-Tahrir wa tanwir of Ibn Ashur, like Ruhul Ma'ani for Al-Alusi, because they consider all the Qira'at, we consider them the best books of Tafsir. So when you ask me, is it important? Yes, definitely it's important. I don't want anyone to panic. But this is the word of Allah, which is extremely profound. And it should be taken seriously. Studying the Quran for 10 or 20 years is not enough. You must give it all of yourself so that it might give you a little bit of it. That's why one of the first advices I was given from my sheikh, give the Quran all of yourself so that it gives you a little bit of itself. So every book, ya yeah, sheikh, was written in the world for the world to read it. But the Quran is not like that. The Quran is the book that was not written in this world. It descended upon the world from outside the world for the world to read it. It's, when I, when I read the word, Tanzilu Rabbil Alameen, it is a bestowal from on high, from the Lord of the realms. It, it shakes me, really. Yes, it takes time to study the Qur'an and explore its layers of understanding. The Qur'an is not information printed on paper. The Qur'an is a ruh, spirit. Allah said in Surah Ashura, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا And thus have we revealed to you a spirit by our command. The one who knows how to deal with the Qur'an and how to do tadabbur or pondering will feel that it turns into a spirit inside the heart, a living being that reads it. 
you read books, but the Quran is a book that reads you. When you ponder upon its words, the Quran starts reading your mind. And I don't want people who don't understand Arabic to panic as well. Well, like, you know, I have a playlist, which is a one day workshop, uh, a playlist of four videos on, on, um, on my YouTube channel. And it's, a, it, it's called how to ponder the Quran, even if you don't know Arabic. And the reason why we, we in Bridges translated this new translation is to try to, to, to bring to the people or to bring people closer to the spirit of the Quran. Not only, it's not only about translating the meanings of the words of the Quran. It's also about translating the style of Allah in speech. And by the way, I would like to take uh, time out here and, and, and thank you. Wallahi, your dedication, Dr. Yusuf, wallahi, your dedication and commitment to the work that you have done. Because Dr. Yusuf reviewed the uh, translation of the Qiraat, all the footnotes that have the Qiraat, Dr. Yusuf uh, uh, reviewed it. And he really, really benefited us a lot. He was, his meticulousness was really outstanding. Barakallah fiqh, may Allah bless you. I don't want to praise you more than that because I should have... Yeah. 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 So if you want to understand mm -hmm. the holistic meaning of an ayah that has two different modes of recitation, yes, you should check if the difference of the, in the Qiraat is only dialectical or does it carry any uh, uh, difference in meaning? Or is it just a variation that gives an extra uh, uh, meaning like that example, which we just gave. So if there's an extra meaning, you should ponder both meanings. And you should understand that both meanings can be combined together. If, if you allow me, uh, Father, if you allow me just uh, with a quick tangent, uh, probably would help the audience, inshallah, connect more to the to the session. Zakhla khair for your, uh, for, for thanking me for the little work that I added because I know other brothers and mashayikh and scholars have contributed to this uh, too. And I'm not a doctor too, by the way, just like a, <laughs> a quick uh, side comment. Zakhla khair. Um, <laughs> may Allah bless you, Amin, and, and accept your work, inshallah. Just a quick tangent. So when we say qiraat and Muslim recitation, just wanted to, that everybody is for us to not to be lost. So um, it's a, again, it's a, it's a, it's a long topic, and that will be covered in the course, inshallah. But in in short, the Muslims, the, the consensus of Muslims and the Muslim scholars have settled that we have ten qiraat to Muslim recitation that are agreed upon to be authentic ways of reading the Quran. And those qiraat are ten, and each qari has two narrators, has two rawi, qari wa rawi, qari wa rawiya. So each qari has two narrators who narrated the Quran from him with some slight differences. So the total is 20 different narrations that we read the Quran through. Uh, a very important point is, what does it mean when we say like um, the qira'a or the narration of Hafs, the narration of Asim, the narration of, uh, of Shu'ba, whether the, ra the rawi, the narrator, or the qari uh, himself. The point here is, we don't mean that this person has invented or created this qira'a. This person, it's, it's an isba tukhtiyari ada, as the scholar said, just like this scholar, who dedicated his life to receive the Quran from the generation of the Tabi'een. Some of them actually uh, uh, witnessed some of the Sahaba, like Abu Ja'far was one of the very early uh, Qurra. So they were very close to, the, to the, the real golden generation of Quran. So they received the Quran from the Sahaba, from the Tabi'een, who are coming from different dialectic backgrounds. And those Sahaba ha had their own ways of reading the Quran, the way the Prophet Sallallahu permitted them to read, which is part of the Rahmah, the mercy of Allah, who allowed them to use their uh, different dialectic backgrounds in reading the Quran. This did not affect the meaning. It was just like a kind of performative uh, differences, like as the Sad Father mentioned, like saying wadduha, wadduhe, wadduhe, three different differences in the performance, in the, 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 the pronunciation of the Arab, but it did not affect the meaning whatsoever. The only point is those Sahaba are coming from different backgrounds. The Arabic language is not only one dialect, there are a lot of different dialects, there are different uh, tribes who had uh, different ways of pronouncing the letters and sometimes some of the words with the Arab, the syntax had only had also influence on this. So the Sahaba delivered the Quran this way to those Qurra and the Tabi'een, the, the righteous predecessors also delivered the Quran this way. So there were multiple, uh, huge variety of dialectic differences. Those Qurra, they dedicated their life, they dedicated their knowledge to compile these differences in, in some sort of consistent way 
in their own isnad, in their own chain of qira'ah, connected back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then they delivered it to people. And then the majmu'ah, the majority of the ummah have agreed that those are the qura'ah that we follow. So again, when we say Nafi Hafs, uh, Abu Ja'far, Yaqub, they're for sure like righteous people, biggest scholars, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. Uh, they are the, the, the budur, the, the stars of, uh, of the narrations of the Qur'an, as Imam Shah to be mentioned and praised them for sure. But again, they did not invent this. The Qur'an is Qur'an. It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You read it, alhamdulillah, the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received it from Jibreel and delivered it to us. And this is the beauty of Isnad, the beauty of a chain of narrators connected to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm for sure doing this in a very nutshell, but this is this is a summary of... Uh, I think he muted the, uh, yes, now, now, now it's unmuted, yeah. He's like saying Sahih al-Bukhari, the ahadith of al-Bukhari, they are not of mm-hmm. al-Bukhari. He just collected them and he worked on them. So it is named after them just because they, every one of them mastered his qira'ah and he delivered it to people. So they named it after him, but it's not his qira'ah. It is the Qur'an that came from Allah and it came mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. That just to, uh, to conclude this part, in the long story short, we have two major types of, of differences. The first one is uh, dialectic, it's just like the way you read, the way you pronounce the letter or the word does not affect the meaning, which is basically the biggest part of the differences. The second part is uh, different ways of, of reading, uh, so, sorry, the different differences or differences that actually add other another layers and dimensions of the meanings without any kind of contradiction. The reason for the second part, part of it is the lexic as well, because part of it is syntax, part of it is ira, part of it is the first or the second person, right? And this one of the very beautiful things about the translation of grudges is that in every single page, and I have the, the book in front of me, in every single page, uh, we mention the first and the second person in terms of the pronouns or the dama. So qira'a would say ya'malun, qira'a would say ta'malun. It adds a very little difference to the meaning, but it, it's also part of the syntax, part of the vastness of the Arabic grammar and the Arabic language. So just, I think, I hope this is a very um, uh, enough summary, inshallah, for the audience to understand when we say qira'at or qurra, just to know that, the, to, to follow us in, in a consistent sequence. Again, this is for sure, I'm, I'm doing uh, this not, uh, I'm not doing justice to, to this point, but inshallah, again, we'll be expanding more on this, inshallah, in the course. I'm sorry, uh, Sir Father, for uh, the, 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 the interruption. If I would just add, uh, just to move on to the point that you were explaining and add another question. So I, I, I try probably to, to make it very easy now and to say, okay, we have two ways of difference or two, two different types of differences and they do not affect the meaning that much. But it's still, it's a big source of uh, misconception and shubuhat and attacks and Islam and Quran. And I'm sure you experience a lot of these things. You have, you have mashallah, a lot of work in terms of the da'wah and dealing with people who are uh, raising a lot of shubuhat and misconceptions about Islam and about Quran. Like people, you know, they, they, they just like uh, uh, snap these different uh, differences or like the, you would quote a scholar or quote a person or a speaker that would mention something about Quran or Quran and they would say, see, now you have uh, mistakes in the Quran. Now you have different ways. Which one the Prophet pronounced, right? Which one the Prophet, uh, the, what, what is the exact, what is the sahih, right? Like in hadith, you have sahih and da'if. So what is the sahih? How come you tell me there are too many ways there are too many narrations to, to the Quran. So it's still a big point of misconception for a lot of people. So I know you want to add more examples. And we go back to the examples because it's very beautiful. And I think it's a, a beautiful connection with the Quran. But I would like you just to, to shed light on this point, if you don't mind. You comment on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Islamophobes say it's a mistake and there are mistakes in the Quran and Muslims are not sure which one is right. Only an ignorant person would think that this is a mistake. In the previous example, two diacritical marks gave two different valid meanings that are not contradicting and each one of them can stand alone giving a layer of understanding, a layer of the meaning. And both together gave a whole picture from two different angles. Only an idiot would think that this happened haphazardly or by mistake. What mistake? This miraculous dimension left the, the matters of Arabic and yeah, the, the, the masters of Arabic poetry incapacitated and thwarted. They could not take the challenge of writing something as long as one chapter, one surah of the Quran because of this miraculous aspect. So if that was by mistake, well, mistakes are not going to bring something miraculous like that. Mistakes are going to bring two meanings that are contradicting 
or maybe one of the meanings doesn't make sense at all, but never something like that. So that's, that's definitely it's not by mistake. Mm -hmm. So is, is, like, is there any kind of evidence or uh, hadith or proof that suggested that the Prophet ﷺ recited actually in multiple ways or taught his companions in, in multiple ways? Of course, beside the chains of narration of the Qiraat, we have hadith in the Sunnah, like, for example, a hadith of Lady Aisha that is narrated in both in uh, Sunan Abi Dawood and in Sahih al-Tirmidhi, where Lady Aisha narrated that she heard the Prophet, peace be upon him, reciting Farouhun uh, Warayhan. Uh, 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 so, Faruhun Warayhan is the Qira'ah of Ruwais an Ya'qub, Imam Ruwais an Imam Ya'qub, which is a Qira'ah. What, but the majority of the narrators read it, Faruhun Warayhan, not Faruhun Warayhan. And this proves that the Prophet uh, 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 told us all these Qira'at. Scholars have put three strict conditions for any qira'ah to be considered authentic and be accepted. So let's mention in a nutshell the journey of the Qur'an. The Qur'an was sent from God with the trustworthy angel Jibreel upon the heart of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with all its meanings and all its modes of recitations, which is, are the qira'at, and all its ahruf, which are the dialects, and that's something else. So it was downloaded on the Prophet's heart. Then he dictated uh, uh, what he received from Allah to the companions, who wrote it down on parchments. And they are known as the scribes of the revelation, katabat al-wahi. There are about 48 companions who worked as scribes of the revelation for Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Therefore, every single word of the Qur'an was written immediately in the presence of the Prophet Wasallam, directly after he uttered it from his tongue. But it was written on parchments, as we said. And it was written in the presence of other witnesses. Then the Prophet Wasallam used to present the Qur'an to Archangel Jibreel in the presence of some companions who are known uh, 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 for being the masters of the sciences of the Qur'an. Usually that was, this presentation was every Ramadan. But before his death in the last Ramadan, he presented the Qur'an twice in the presence of some companions like Ubay ibn Ka'b, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abu Darda, uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, and others. After a few months of the death of the Prophet Wasallam, his companions decided to collect all the written Qur'an parchments in a form of a book. And they chose Zayd ibn Thabit to do that, so he accepted every parchment under the condition that two witnesses would witness that it was written in the fr in front of them in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. So every parchment that comes, there must be two people who would witness. And they say, I witness that Prophet Muhammad, that this was written in the presence of Prophet Muhammad in front of my eyes. So he collected all the 6,236 ayahs like that, except one ayah that he did not find, except one witness to witness, to testify that it was written in the presence of Prophet Muhammad. And they were in trouble because they have put this rule and all of them memorized this ayah and they know that it is from the Quran, but there is only one witness and they have put the rule and they found that that man, who was called Khuzayma uh, uh, ibn Thabit, uh, was uh, uh, spoken about by Prophet Muhammad that his testimony is equal to two testimonies of two people. 
Why? Because of a certain incident that happened with the Prophet Sallallahu So he said, this man should be trusted like two people in, if, if he ever testifies. And subhanAllah, that ayah was accepted because of that. Though all of them even have, have memorized it. Therefore, every word in the Quran was written in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, memorized by many companions, collected and compiled in a book form after a few months of the Prophet's death. Then Caliph Uthman copied them and sent a copy to every country with a teacher teaching how to recite it. The companions used to differ in their modes of recitation which are taken from the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but some of them preferred some modes and some others preferred other modes. And they taught these modes to the next generations who are known as At-Tabi'een. At-Tabi'een means the followers, the followers of the Sahaba, the followers of the companions. And they are the students of uh, uh, the companions, as I said. Um, they are known for being extremely righteous, exactly like the companions. The only privilege of the companions is that they are companions of Prophet Muhammad. But that generation after them is as righteous as the companions, according to scholars. Then appeared the third generation from which the Imams of the Qira'at belong. So the Imams of the Qira'at read and learned the Quran under the greatest scholars of the Quran. And the chain of narration between them and the Prophet Sallallahu is a very short chain of narration. Only two people or three people maximum. Uh, uh, and those are generations of tabaqat that are considered the best generations of Muslims. Because the Prophet said the best three generations are the first three generations. Some Imams like Imam Nafi' read the whole Quran under the supervision of 70 of the Tabi'een the followers. Imam Asim as well read it for tens of the tabi'in. And back to the three strict conditions, because I took you away from it. Back to the three strict conditions that are uh, important for any qara'ah to be considered authentic. Number one, it has to comply with the spelling of the Mus'haf of Uthman. So what Uthman compiled this Qira'ah uh, has to comply with it in order to be accepted. Second, it has to comply with the rules of Arabic grammar. Third, it has to be narrated by an authentic chain of narration. Some people added tawatur, which is uh, uh, as a condition, which is that the number of the chains of narration has to be massive like in some ahadith. But in Qira'at, the number does not have to be massive to consider, to consider it tawatur. Only three ways or three chains uh, can be accepted because of how short the chain is and because of the strict condition of being compliant with the text, with the, with the text of the Uthmani Mus'haf, still the qira'at are all mutawatir in most aspects, alhamdulillah, but it is true, and I have to say that, it is true that in the performance aspect only, some things are authentic, but not mutawatir, may not reach us from, uh, from several chains, but only maybe from one chain of narration, which is an authentic chain. And I will give you an example. In Qira'at Hamza, in Surah Al-Kahf, there is a word in which he paused before the ta. He always pauses before the hamza, but here he paused before the ta, which is فَمَسْطَاعُوا أَيَّظْهَرُوهُ He said, he read it, فَمَسْطَاعُوا He paused before the ta. This is authentic, but not mutawatir. It did not reach us from several ways, from several chains. But at the end, it's just a matter of performance. The word is as it is. Even diacritic marks are the same, just pausing before a letter. So this is not, for example, mutawatir. And I have to be truthful. It's not mutawatir, but it doesn't affect the meaning in the least. Okay. Just like Allah khairan. I think this, uh, this part in the middle, I think that connects a lot of dots. So now I think 
uh, the, the context will be much more clear, inshallah, for, for all of us, um, I'm not sure if you want to, to go back to other examples to, uh, I know we started with example from, from uh, uh, Surah Al-Shu'ara, uh, the end of Surah Al-Shu'ara. So I would like ready to go for one or two other examples that we have, inshallah, more time for that. Inshallah, inshallah. Well, let's take another example. And from the same surah, Surah Shara. The reason why mm -hmm. I picked up from Surah Shara is that we are doing in Arabic daily tadabbur on Facebook and on YouTube since the lockdown started. So today was the 118th halaqa in 118 days, subhanAllah. That's and right. just finished a shu'ara recently. So these, I, I came uh, across these uh, examples. So it was easier for me to, to, uh, to give them. Let's go to the beginning of Surah Al-Shu'ara, Ayah 12 and Ayah 13. When Allah ordered Prophet Musa to go to Pharaoh and to uh, warn him. قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي أَخَافُ أَيُّ كَذِّبُونَ وَيَضِيقُوا صَدْرِي وَلَا يَنْطَلِقُوا لِسَانِي فَأَرْسِلْ إِلَى هَارُونَ it means, and recall when your Lord called to Moses, go to the unjust people, the people of Pharaoh. Will they never be mindful? He said, my Lord, I fear that they will disbelieve me and my chest tightens and my tongue is not fluent. So send for Aaron too. There is a different qira'ah in this ayah. It is called qira'at Ya'qub. Imam Ya'qub al-Hadrani. Ya'qub read it as, sadri instead of sadri. Lisani instead of Lisani. Fa'arsil ila haru. It means, I fear that they will disbelieve me and that my chest will tighten and my tongue will not be pure. Let me, let me share screen and show people um, uh, the difference, inshallah, in the diacritical, the diacritical marks. Now I learned how to share screen. I will share it easily, inshallah. Here. You can see it? Yeah. Okay, guys. You see here, the qara of Hafs that we read, it says, وَيَضِيقُ That is, this is called the Dhamma, which makes the sound U. وَيَضِيقُ صَدْرِي Here, وَلَا يَنْطَلِقُ لِسَانِي But, قِرَاءَةِ عَقُوبِ Instead of the Dhamma, there is فَتْحَ So it gives the sound أَ وَيَضِيقَ صَدْرِي وَلَا يَنْطَلِقَ لِسَانِي What does this mean? Let me show you. Uh, The first mode of recitation, brothers and sisters, denotes that Moses is telling Allah that his chest tightens frequently, which means that he gets easily nervous and that his tongue is not fluent because he spent 10 years in a foreign country speaking a foreign language. But in Qira'at Ya'qub, when the letter Qaf had a fatha, it became Yadiqa, Yantaliqa, it gives a different meaning. It means that Moses told Allah that he is afraid that his chest, uh, uh, um, that his chest will tighten and that his tongue will not be fluent. There's a big difference between my chest tightens frequently and my tongue is not fluent. And between I am afraid that will chest may tighten. And I'm afraid that my tongue may not be fluent. So what is, of course, they are very, very close to each other, but they are different meanings. Let's see now the holistic meaning. The holistic meaning is a combination of the two layers. After combining both qiraat, it is that Moses told God, I am afraid that my chest will tighten because it already does. And my tongue will not be fluent because it is already like that. So this means that Moses knows his weaknesses and he is not trying to avoid the responsibility, but he just cares a lot about the quality of the Islamic rhetoric. 
And if you read and you study the chapter or the surah called the poets, al-shu'ara, it, it focuses about the media. The poets were the journalists of the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And Pharaoh used al-hashirin. Al-hashirin means the summoners where, who are actually the media personnel of Pharaoh whom he used to influence the, the, the public. And, and here we see Prophet Moses also worried about the strength of the rhetoric because he wants the message to get through to all people in the best of manner. So now we saw that with a little diacritical mark difference, two different meanings, they are not contradicting, and they are like layers of meanings that give the holistic meaning that make the ayah more clear, that make the ayah high definition, as I said. Jazakallah khairan. I think uh, just um, a quick uh, comment. Um, I honestly thought about it. I felt it might be confusing for some people. And uh, Sheikh Ismail Isa, he reminded us in the comments. When you mentioned the example of Ista'u, Fukrat Hamza, he had bil bil tajdid, he said bil sect. I think he used the word sect. That's why probably it uh, was confusing with the people of Tajdid and Qiraat. He wala yaskut, he yushadid. So it's Ista'u. But usually because, you know, in, in Qiraat, it's this one of the hard... Uh, uh, like uh, words to pronounce sometimes to, to, to begin uh, to move from from sukun to tajid is something very difficult in the qira'at mm -hmm. so just like out of a kind of um, to make sure that the meaning was uh, or the qira'at was explained properly it's that what, what do you what do you meant is the tajdid and not actually the sukun it's not the pause the sukun muqabil al waqf sukun bila tanafus wa kan al tajdid so jazakallah khair brother sheikh ismail for uh, for reminding us about this and 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 I actually thought about it when you mentioned, and I wasn't sure if it was really uh, uh, like delivered to the people of Quran and Quran and in, in, um, in the way that they can they can understand. Uh, so, do you think um, is it is it possible still that we can actually cover uh, one more example, if 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 yeah. possible, or? Um, sure, sure. Let's I think the examples are now so that the, the beauty of the examples now they are consistent, right? And I think that they're emphasizing the same point of, uh, of the multi layer meanings. Um, uh, for sure, we don't have really to give examples of differences that, you know, that they do not affect the meanings a lot, right? We mentioned already that sometimes there are differences based on the syntax, there are differences based on the first or the second person. It adds a little bit a different uh, layer to the meaning. The, the beautiful thing about the examples you're given, Sheikh, is. Uh, they, they need more reflection to get to them, right? They need more uh, pondering on the ayat to get to them. Versus, for example, when we say, uh, or if I understand the point of the first and the second person, it's now I understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing them directly or addressing them with a stupid tifat, with a kind of a grammatical shift to, to add. Th th this also needs to be explained, but I think it's probably easier to understand that there is uh, a rhetorical uh, style that is called grammatical shift of Ustubul Intifat with Balaba. And when I read it or I understand it, I understand that it, it emphasizes a certain point or, or grabs attention to something or to highlight a certain point in the ayat uh, more than others. While these examples that you are mentioned are very subtle, the differences are very subtle. You don't even, uh, uh, sometimes a person with a quick qira'a wouldn't actually pay a lot of attention to. I remember in, while working on the translation, we used to have discussions about some of the words are they are going really to add uh, like multiple layers to the meanings or not? Specifically, those uh, um, or differences that are based on a very slight difference in the pronunciation. Uh, some of them would have, and, and English was 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 also, and I really want you to to comment on this. The English was was also a challenge for us, right? Because sometimes we know, me and you, we know that there is a difference, right? But it's it's very hard to convey this difference in English. So, for example, the, the, the two qira'at of uh, uh, I, I remember we had discussion in Surah An-Nisa with Al-Qasr or Al-Alif Lamastum versus Lamastum There is a khilaf faqih that is very related to this, right? What, what does Lams mean? Is it just the mere touching? Is it skin contact? Or it means the, the actual relationship between a man and a woman? And the two qira'at are affecting these understandings of the ayah But to convey this in English 
it's actually hard, right? And in the footnotes, you have to write it in a kind of a full sentence just to explain it. And we were trying to avoid explaining in the footnotes and in the translation because we didn't really want to uh, to enforce a certain explanation of the ayat or to go, like, and if you want to do this in English, are we going to mention, like, to lessen the footnotes of different opinions of fuqaha? This is not the, the point or the job of a book of tips or a book of, the, uh, of translation of Quran, right? It's not a fiqh book. And it's going to make the margins very long. So um, the Arabic versus English is also a very important point. It's a big challenge for us to convey some of these meanings uh, sometimes in, in, uh, in English um, as well. So I would really like if, if you just can give a quick comment on the challenge in com um, of uh, conveying the meanings from Arabic to English, specifically, again, those very subtle differences. And then if, if we can conclude with one more example of the differences of the Qur'at, and, and that'll be enough, inshallah. Well, well, let me tell you that. Even in Arabic, just learning the Qur'an is not enough. You have to learn the Qur'an, mm -hmm. you follow the tafsir, and you read the tafsir, and you learn how to do tadabbur in order to fathom the whole thing. Uh, of course, English, uh, of course, English, by the way, is one of the richest Western languages, if not the richest Western language, and still because of the completely different structure of the English language, and, and, and from the, the Arabic language, it was a big challenge. And one of the things I think uh, that I need also to say about Bridges' translation is that it's, it's not only about the meanings translation, it's about the style itself in speech. Mm -hmm. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the character over 500 times in past tense. And very, nearly all non-Arab speaking people don't know that because 165 translators turned the past tense into future tense because it's a future event, the hereafter. But in our translation, you see it as it is. Past tense and the footnote that tells you frequently the Quran addresses the events of the hereafter in past mm -hmm. tense. And this should be pondered by the reader, should be pondered by you. Here mm -hmm. you have to ponder. You go to the books of Tafsir and you search. And um, one of the also things is that, um, for example, the, in the pronouns, in Arabic, there's a lot of pronouns, but in English, anta is you, antum, which is you when you are addressing a group of people, is also you. Mm -hmm. Antuma, which is you when you are addressing two people, is just you in English. So the problem here is, of course, most translators solve this by adding brackets and writing between brackets, O oh, Muhammad, you, O oh, Muhammad, to tell the reader that this you is singular. But Allah said the word Muhammad just four times in the Quran. Why are you adding 1004? Uh, it's between brackets, so it's, people know that it's not from the text. That's true, that's true, but still it will have an, eff an, an effect on the heart. So when Allah is addressing you in a singular form and you are reading it, you also understand that this is a command for you. Uh, people uh, or uh, translators used to put between brackets, O oh people or O oh believers to say to that this you is plural. What did we do? We have uh, given a, uh, we have put a, a suffix uh, S, G, and P, L to denote that this U is singular or plural. Allow me to share screen quickly and show people um, something. Here. Okay. Bismillah. Mm. I was uh, going to share it. Thank you. <laughs> hopefully people can see uh, this. No, not this. Um, do you see any SG or PL in this? Um, Here, here in this ayah, he said, 
are you supplying me with wealth? This is what Suleiman said to the messengers of the Queen of Sheba. He said, are you with PL? This PL stands for plural. Because if people don't see this, they will think that Suleiman is speaking to the messenger only. But here he is speaking to all the people of Sheba, all the people of Saba. Are you supplying me with wealth? So we have put this PL, which means it's a plural. This U is plural. And same thing happens also with the, uh, uh, with the imperative tenses. So for example, قُلْ say. قُولُ is also say, which is when, Allah, when you are giving a command to a group of people. Anyway, would you like me now to give you the last example? Uh, yes, I think we have uh, some more. Yeah, we have some more time for one more example. I'm going to with this example, inshallah. I know it's, uh, it's late at night in, in your okay. place now, okay. so I'm really appreciating the time you're putting into this. No problem. I ended the share screen, right? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Now, the Quran says in Surah Al Baqarah, ayah number 37. And by the way, ayah, we translated it as sign, not as verse. And I think the reason why then the translators translated uh, as verse, it's because the very first translators of the Quran followed the footsteps of Bible translators. But verse is the unit of text in poetry. Sentence is the unit of text in prose. The Quran is neither poetry nor, uh, or prose, nor prose. The Quran is a different type of text. Every um, uh, unit of text in the Quran is an ayah. Ayah means sign. Every, every unit of text in the Quran is a sign from God. So here there is sign number 37. It says, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِن رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Which means thereupon, Adam received words from his Lord, thus he granted him repentance and accepted it from him. So because the word Adam ends with a Dhamma, diacritic mark Dhamma, it means that Adam is the subject. But in the next Qira'ah, which I will show you now, Adam is not the subject. I will show you now the both Qira'at, inshallah. Uh, let me share screen. Bismillah. Here. This is the Quran that we read. Hafs. Fatalaqa Adamu. See this Dhamma? Adamu. Min Rabbihi Kalimatin. This Tanween underneath. This means that Adam received words from his Lord. So who is the subject Adam? Because he received. Okay? Words. The words of his Lord are the object which he received it. Let's see Ibn Kathir of Mecca, the Imam of uh, the Qira'ah of Mecca, called Ibn Kathir. He spelled it, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمَا Instead of Dhamma, there is Fatha. And this makes Adam the object. مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٌ And he has put this tanween here above two Dhammas, which means that the words of the Lord became the subject. What does that mean? Well, this variation, uh, according to the first way of recitation, which we normally read because it's Hafs, it means thereupon Adam received words from his Lord. Uh, and thus he granted him repentance and accepted it from him. According to the second way of recitation, thereupon Adam was received by words from his Lord. Some people may say, how can words receive a person? The first Qira'ah emphasizes on the duty of the human being to repent. So Adam received words of repentance to use it to repent. So every human being needs to repent. While the Qira'ah of Imam Ibn Kathir emphasizes on the spiritual metaphor that even 
when man repents, it is the words of the Lord that embrace him. It's spiritual. It means that even when you do your duty and repent, it is the grace of Allah that he accepts it from you. So it is the, the repentance that embraced you. Not only you used it. So this example illustrates that the, the fact that the different qiraat are actually a source of enrichment of the Quran. Never do the different qiraat give any conflicting meanings. Rather they complement one another and add depth to the meaning. Something which can be appreciated by pondering the difference uh, caused by a very minor variation in a single diacritical mark or a single letter. This is not something that came by chance. It was an unprecedented linguistic tool intended by the Creator to lend further magnificence to the Noble Quran and add to its miraculous aspect. A linguistic one. Jazakallah khairan, Shaykh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, inshallah, and accept from you. Uh, just before we conclude, I, uh, I remember that um, uh, some people use this translation of uh, bridges to, uh, to propagate, <laughs> saying that, uh, okay, now here we go. Now we have a proof from among Muslims themselves that proves that Quran is, is not one. Uh, book re revealed by God. It's actually uh, multiple different uh, versions and it has mistakes. Like, they use the translation, which was, was actually very ironic and funny. They use the translation uh, as an argument that yes, the Quran has mistakes and the Quran has contradictions and the Quran has multiple versions and multiple. Uh, I'm sure um, you mentioned to me before that there are certain people actually that are pretty popular on social media who use this uh, uh, translation to, to propagate for this and to, to provide an argument that. Uh, as if you are supporting their arguments, basically. This is, this is what, what I think this is what we use the, the translation for. They praised me. They said, <laughs> finally, an honest Muslim is telling people and telling the world that <laughs> there is a house Quran and a watch Quran. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, Islamophobes are not just ignorant about the Quran, but they are also making fun of themselves by trying to fool non-Arab speaking Muslims about an Arabic linguistic dimension of the Quran, thinking that we Arab speaking people are unaware of their childishness. We are not gonna stay quiet. We're gonna be, stay silent. They also try to appear like they are genius explorers who discovered that the Quran has different modes of recitation while this is a very well-known feature of the Quran to any student of knowledge. The Qur'an is a very profound branch of knowledge and that, that has been always there. But that is not new to them because nearly every misconception they throw on Islam generally is from Muslims' books in which scholars wrote after every topic what they can say to answer anyone who may object to their arguments. So they themselves, our scholars, used to invent counter arguments to their arguments, then they answer them. So they used to say, and if someone objects saying so-and-so, we would answer him by saying so-and-so. So these idiots go to our scholars' books and steal these counter arguments in order to appear like they are well learned and knowledgeable, thinking that Muslims won't know the source of their misconceptions. So the source of their misconceptions are our own books. And they are mentioned as misconceptions that maybe one day someone will say it. And in this case, we will answer it like that. At the end, I can't find anything better than the Quran to comment with about them. The Quran says, they want to extinguish Allah's light with their mouth. Yet Allah refuses but to complete his light even if the deniers dislike it. And may Allah bless you and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, 
الله يبارك فيك جزاك الله خير لان ذيس لاست ايه هاز قراءات از ويل سبحان الله اولويز متم نوره ومتم نوره سبحان الله اولويز بيوتي ان ان فايندين اوت اند اكسبلورين ذيس ديفرنت مينينغ جزاك الله خير يا الله سبحانه وتعالى بليس يو اند اكسبت يور ورك ان شاء الله Uh, again, I know uh, this topic is much uh, bigger than this. Uh, inshallah, again, just um, a reminder that the course will start tomorrow, inshallah, at Quran Sciences every Monday. Uh, the link for the details about the course uh, is in the comments for those who are watching us on Facebook. And also, Al Majlis page, Zamla Khiran, they posted uh, your, your YouTube uh, lecture on how to ponder the Quran, even if you don't know Arabic. It's in the comments because you did mention that. So, if someone wants to, to just expand on this point about how to connect with the Quran, Uh, and it's a very common question for sure that always people um, ask, like, if I don't know Arabic, uh, even, even Arabic-speaking Muslims as well, sometimes, you know, a lot of, all of us basically, we don't have this level of fasaha and eloquence of the Qur'an, so we always need to know how to connect to the Qur'an or with the Qur'an in multiple ways. So, like Allah khairan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, accept from you, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your effort and bless your work. So, like Allah khairan, barak Allah fikum. Inshallah, nalqaq qariban, inshallah, we'll host you on another Uh, event and another topic, hopefully about Quran for sure, inshallah, about Quran. Jazakallah khairan, barakallah fikum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.